an electronic computer receiving information from hundreds of different sources throughout the country, carrying out calculations and sending out results in tiny fractions of a second. But computers have to be designed and built, and their programs have to be worked out by people, by us. And we possess far, far smaller computers of our own, which in the long run are far, far more powerful, our brains. This is a human brain. It contains 15,000 million nerve cells, whose activities enable us to control our bodies, to think, to experience emotions, to be human. It's a center of electrical activity. This girl is having the electrical activity in parts of her brain recorded by an electroencephalograph. Electrodes in contact with her skin pick up electrical signals from her brain. This is a technique used to check up on whether the brain is working normally. The girl's brain is quite normal. This is just a demonstration. The signals are amplified and fed to a paper trace recorder. Each trace shows activity in a certain part of her brain. We'll watch what happens when her brain receives sight stimuli, when she's looking at something, compared with when her eyes are closed. Open your eyes. Look at these two traces in the middle when her eyes are open. And close them. When she closes them, the pattern changes. It gets wavier. Open your eyes. See the change when she's looking again. And close them again. And back to the eyes closed pattern again. What this shows is that electrical changes occur in the brain when it's doing something. In this case, receiving information through the eyes. When they're shut, we get this pattern. which changes to this when she opens her eyes. Another experiment. Her eyes are open and a light's flashing into them. The rate at which it flickers can be altered. Here, it's flashing fairly slowly. One of the traces shows electrical activity in her brain of the same frequency as the flashing light. If the frequency is increased, the light made to flash on and off more rapidly, this is followed on the trace. The electrical activity in part of her brain recorded by the trace speeds up. There we are, the fast flicker and the slower one. Fast slow. So the brain is a center of electrical activity. It's connected to all parts of the body through the nervous system, a network of wires, you could call them, which can transmit electrical signals to and from the brain. On this model, you can see the main cable, the spinal cord, carrying nerve fibers down the body, inside the spine, and branching off to different parts of the body. This is a model. Here is an actual human spinal cord with its thick bundles of nerves. Part of the covering has been left on this short section. See those main branches dividing off to serve the two legs? Each nerve fibre is a bundle of separate nerves, which are themselves made up of very long nerve cells, like the strands of an electrical multi-core cable. These are the nerve fibres from the bottom of the spinal cord. Like all nerves, these carry electrical impulses to and from the brain. Here's another demonstration. This electrode can be pressed against the skin near a nerve, and it can send electrical impulses along the nerve, instead of her brain doing that. The impulses cause the muscle fibres in her hand to contract and her fingers move. There's nothing she can do about it. The nerve is acting as an electrical conductor 
as it does when her brain sends electrical signals along nerves to various parts of the body. This technique can be used to discover whether people have nerve damage of certain kinds. Here, there's nothing wrong with her nerve. We're just demonstrating how nerves act as electrical conductors. It's not painful, by the way. The impulses aren't very powerful. Here's something else. If we fasten these electrodes to the right part of her hand, we can detect the electrical activity in her muscle when she decides to move her hand. This time, her brain is sending down electrical commands, and we're detecting the electrical activity at the muscle when these arrive, and she moves her fingers. We can see the electrical activity using an oscillograph. Muscle and brain connected by nerves which carry the electrical signals that enable us to move and to feel things. The brain is an extremely complicated organ, but we do know some things about it. The cerebrum, the folded area, is the thinking part of the brain, highly developed in man. The cerebellum here has a lot to do with activities we don't have to think about, like keeping our balance, for example. And there's the brain stem, the connection to the spinal cord. Because the brain contains so many millions of active living cells, it needs to have a good blood supply. Here are some of the main blood vessels in the brain. Damage to the brain's blood circulation can put parts of the brain out of action, as we'll see later. We know that different areas of the cerebrum do different jobs. This is the motor area, which controls many of our movements. Parts of this area are in action whenever we make any movements, large or small. Different portions of the motor area control different parts of the body. This part at the top controls movement of the abdomen. From here, messages are sent to the thorax, the arms, the hands, the fingers, the thumb, the neck. From here at the bottom, signals go out to the muscles of the tongue. Movements of the eye muscles are controlled from a different area of the cerebrum, here. Messages from the eyes when we see things are received and decoded at the back of the cerebrum, near the back of the skull, here. While signals from the ears are partly dealt with here. That's right. Now get that pull up and don't lean back. That's the part of her brain which is active as she listens to the ballet teacher. This boy's been blind since he was born. On the clay. And it always went in. He's feeling the braille through his fingertips. Another important brain area has to do with the sense of touch. It's here, next to the motor area. How do we know these things about the geography of the brain? Which parts control which activities? Well, it's possible to produce X-ray pictures of the brain using machines such as this. When it's switched on, beams of X-rays will pass through her skull and brain at different angles as the X-ray tube rotates. By measuring the amount of X radiation which can be detected at the different angles, a computer can construct pictures of different slices of the brain. We're seeing cross sections through her skull at different levels, moving upwards towards the top of her head. The front of her skull's at the top of the screen, the back at the bottom. The dark areas in the middle are occupied by brain matter, and any part of the brain damaged by illness or injury would show up. There's nothing to see on these scans, as they're called, because her brain's perfectly normal. And there's another way of getting pictures of the brain, using high-frequency radio waves in a strong magnetic field, as we saw in another of these films. 
The detail is splendid. Here's the cerebrum. The cerebellum. And here's the brain stem. Now, if the pictures show damage in any part of the brain, then we know from the patient's symptoms what that damaged part is normally supposed to do. For example, this area has to do with hearing and the assigning of meanings to words. And it's linked with this other area where words are formed into sentences. It's been discovered that damage to one or both of these areas may mean that the patient finds it difficult to communicate. Good morning, Betty. Good morning. How are you today? Oh, fine, thank you. Now, tell me a little bit about your job. Uh, before I have uh, hairdressing, mm -hmm. well, I... This lady, being helped by a speech therapist, suffered a stroke. A blood clot interfered with the blood supply to the speech area of her brain. She's perfectly intelligent, but she can't express herself easily in words. Actually, no. Not right in Denton. Come. Uh, Could you just take a look at these pictures for me, Keith, and tell me what's happening in each picture? What about that one? It's uh, fishing. Uh, just fishing. That's lovely. Good. What about that one? Fishing. Uh, no. Fishing. Man and dog. He too had a stroke which temporarily interfered with the same area of the brain. The motor area wasn't affected and the muscles he uses in speech work perfectly. Can you make that one out? This is um, frying. He has the same problem as if he tries to write down rather than speak the words. Keith, can you just write down for me what's happening in the picture? The result takes a long time, and it's not always correct. What's that one called? It says time. One of the symptoms of damage to these areas of the brain which interpret words is that the person uses wrong words, often without realising. That's it. That's lovely. And what about that one? What's that? That's a key. Or a Mm -hmm. yeah. And how would we use it? That's fine, thank you. Harold, I want you to have a look at this pattern for me. And there's one large one at the top. The doctors and the surgeons and the speech therapists and all the others who help people to recover as much use as possible of their damaged brains aren't just helping people in trouble, although that's the most important thing to do. They're also often adding to our knowledge of that wonderful organ, the human brain. Thank you.